magnificent Howard Baum. Howard, how are you doing today? Hey guys, it's an honor. Thanks for that uh, blush inducing uh, intro. I appreciate it. Hey, I always try. And like I told you off air, I thanked Vandal the same way. I was at a job that I was not a fan of. And I saved the 605 Super Podcast to get me through shifts. And your comedy, Vandal's comedy and history knowledge, same with Scott Cornish, Brian Last, everybody over at Arcadian Vanguard, I love what you do. And ask Dave, I'm always talking his ear off about, you got to check this podcast. I know you don't have time for podcasts, but carve out four and a half hours for the newest 605 and you will laugh your ass off. Well, for sure. You know, Brian Last was a visionary and he plucked us from the ashes of, you know, guys that would have been just a byline in an old mimeographed um, dirt sheet, you know, from the olden days. All of us guys, me, Vandal, um, it's just a whole pack of us, Norman the Weasel, Dooley, Jim Cornette, we all go back to the old mimeographed bulletins and um, there was no thrill. You kids today won't know the thrill of being 10 years old and getting some mail delivered and you get an issue of Jeff Singer's Dropkick or something. You could still smell the, uh, the mimeograph on it. And um, it was just a treat because you could see what was going on in other areas and everything. And if not for the great Brian Last, he truly plucked us from uh, obscurity because all of us guys like Vandal and myself, we were there back in the olden days. We rubbed elbows. We saw the greats in action before we ever know. Before we ever knew that there was going to be a podcast about it or anything like that. And it's lucky uh, because wrestling has gone the way of the freak show and roller derby now. Real, true, professional wrestling, um, which I define as um, all right. I'm old. Um, I define wrestling as kayfabe. If it's not kayfabe, it's not wrestling. And all these kids that want to put on tutus and have little backstage skits and try to out improv each other and be cutesy and not be a real heel and still try to get popular and congratulate your opponents before, during, and after the match. King Curtis and Ox Baker and Killer Carl Cox would come in the dressing room and wipe their asses with this current crop of what's going on. So hello, everybody, and welcome to the show. <laughs> now, Dave, since you're not as familiar with Howard, why don't you hit him with a question? And Absolutely. Uh, like Vandal, uh, too, it's funny. I was telling him, you know, a lot of times we get these guests on and we ask about their fandom and stuff just to kind of get an idea. And it's typical. It's like, you know, 90s or early 2000s, the Cena's, the Rocks. I want to know what your fandom was because you're mentioning names like King Curtis, like, what territory did you grow up on? Okay, well, in 1974, we moved down to South Florida from Union, New Jersey. And uh, this was a downgrade in most ways except for the wrestling. So in 1974, I think it was early 1975, um, I walk in, my dad is watching Canal 23, which for people who are not from Miami, that's Channel 23. That's the... Um, that was they broadcasted the wrestling from the Olympic Auditorium in L.A. And I was in the other room. We we're staying uh, in my aunt's apartment until our house was ready. 1975. I'm like eight years old. And uh, I walk in and I see this production like I've never seen before, this big blue ring. And I say to my dad, what's this? He goes, it's wrestling. So I watch it for a minute. And um, it's lucky I was watching this one particular episode because it was – Sir Oliver Humperdinck and the Hollywood Blondes were having a big feud, apparently, with Louis Tillette. And I think Choi Sun was involved, maybe Greg Valentine. But um, history, now, if we look back, it could have easily been any number of boring shows that was on. It could have been a 90-minute Broadway with Irish Mickey Doyle against Alberto Madrill or something. But it just happened to be one of the most sensational, bloody angles of all time. And then the magazine covered it a month later, and they called it The Night Oliver Humperdinck Almost Lost an Eye. And it had to be the bloodiest angle they ever showed in L.A. wrestling. And when I saw that with my eight-year-old eyes, because I was always a fan 
of monster magazines and Fangoria and all that stuff growing up, hammered Dracula stuff, like monster movies and all that. And when I saw that big bloody angle with Sir Oliver Humperdinck, the night he almost lost an eye, I said, that's it. I found my thing. And I did. A few months later, I was over at a friend's house in third grade and we're watching Florida wrestling. Had no idea there was a such thing as Florida wrestling. And um, it was so much better of, of a production and, and a exciting show that drew you in than the typical L.A. show. Um, and then they said, we're, there's matches every week at the Miami Beach Convention Center. So I said, well, this is mind-blowing information. We've got to go. So my parents weren't about to let me go with this guy's neighbor, some Camaro driving, weed smoking <laughs> 70s guy. They treated me like a like a calf being raised for veal. So my dad started taking me to the matches. 19, August of 1975 was my first match. Jack Briscoe versus Rocky Johnson was the main event. And wow. meanwhile, during the interim, I had been getting into the magazines. My dad was a wrestling fan, so he was educating me on when he used to go see Gene Stanley, Dick the Bruiser, Buddy Rogers, the Sheik, et cetera, at the Laurel Gardens in New Jersey and stuff. And I became intoxicated and, and it was a compulsion to become a wrestling photographer because I would get those old issues where it was just the photos, like the photo issues of the, the magazines. And I saw the great photography of people like Theo Errett and everything. And just by looking at it, I was, I was drawn in to be part of this world. And I was, it was like a course in how to take wrestling photos, how you, how you take a posed photo, how you, you know, what your position should be, the composition. And it just, it wasn't even anything I had to study. It was just like, that's how you take a wrestling photo. So my goal, my, my young bucket list that formed was to become ringside photographer for the magazines at the Miami Beach Convention Center. And fast forward to 1982, at the age of 16, I did just that. They opened up the, the, the uh, guardrail to me. And I was able to place my elbow on the mat and the rest is history. And from there, I went on to shoot for any magazine that you could think of, including Japan and beyond. Now, when did so that, your interest in photography start? Because it sounds like you were a wrestling fan almost as early as you can remember. Like right. for Dave, I mean, I can't speak for Dave, but I know for me, my wrestling fandom started it was watching wrestling superstars and seeing Hulk Hogan get ready in the tunnel before going out to MSG. I think it's probably about, I, I've pinned it at about 86 yeah. and that's when I can remember my earliest. Well, wrestling was, yeah, he was a little bit older. Yeah. For Howard. Um, it's funny. So my earliest, when I started like religiously watching was the uh, Piper snooker angle where Piper cracked the coconut over his head. But before that, I have some early memories, early 83, 82, and the guys that just stuck out with me, one of them was Rocky Johnson, so it was interesting to hear you say his name. Uh, others were Bob Backlund, Jimmy Snuka diving off the top rope. That was just, at that point for me. That was, that was for incredible. sure. Of course, I'm You know, right. w w WWF was good in those days. Mm -hmm. um, or at least parts of it were. And right. also, today's a momentous day. The World Wrestling Federation has made it okay to once again say the words wrestling yes. and wrestlers, <laughs> which is why fuck Vince McMahon. <laughs> I've been saying that for 36 years because I was there as an 18-year-old kid when TNT debuted, and they'd bring in all these guys that built up a career of respect to participate in ridiculous skits and parade them out there and give them new names and crap all over the business that gave him an opportunity to make money. I have been anti-Vince forever. I thought it was the greatest day of all time when he was forced to step down. It's kind of like, um, it's kind of like throwing a 90 year old Holocaust guard in jail now because yeah, he already did it. He already did all his damage 
And Vince's legacy is forever going to be every stupid backstage skit, every ridiculous thing that got away from the roots of professional wrestling, which is just good guy, bad guy, protect kayfabe. That's the most dangerous thing that he did. He got rid of kayfabe. And that's why nothing is believable. Because even though wrestling was silly and ridiculous and anybody with a brain knew that it was not on the up and up, there was always that little seed of doubt. Like maybe this match is real. Maybe this guy is dangerous. Um, We just don't know about this situation. Oh my God, we saw a title change. Didn't see that coming. But, you know, the internet combined with Vince McMahon killing kayfabe made nothing believable. And today's workers, if you can call them that, just add to the situation because they're complimenting their opponents before, during, and after the match and, and coming up with these the ridiculous little promos that they do to each other just to stay cute and whatever. And I mean, if I was going to be an active wrestler today, you would know nothing about me other than my character period. Like MJF is the only modern guy that does it correctly. He doesn't, he doesn't let you in on what he's really like. He doesn't let you behind the curtain. Like almost everyone else in the business does like, Oh, I thought we had great heel chemistry with Rubble. Shut up. No old school guy would be caught dead going on Twitter, complimenting his opponent. And, you know, I used to listen to the old guys and now I'm the old guy. And I'd I'm, I'd be like, oh, how boring. They want to like have a headlock and an arm lock. But it's not. And it, it took me a long time. I would hear these old pros say things like, um, you know, the basics and all this stuff. And now that I've seen the whole business come full circle go from what it was to feasting upon its own corpse by killing itself. And then the whole industry of wrestling became the behind the scenes became more interesting than what was going on in the ring. People used to say who won. Can you imagine that? They'd go like who won or what happened on wrestling. And then that became, Oh, what if if this nobody is going to jump from this company to this company? Like that's what the whole business became the the behind-the-scenes intrigue. And um, I'm a realist. Being the internet, cable, wrestling would not have survived. It would have gone the way of the freak show and and, uh, the rodeo. I don't know if the rodeo is still around or whatever, (laughs) but you get my point. It was a thing of its time. It was a thing that, due to cable uh, and the internet, it was doomed to fail. You can't have all that information out there and an informed public and still have professional wrestling as it was. My hatred for Vince is that he had to distance himself and do away with things that would not have hurt wrestling, that would have only maintained the image and whatever prestige the business had, which was protect the wrestlers, protect the business, And then the stuff that he added into the lexicon of wrestling was copied by every group, major and minor, every independent worker, every independent promoter since the 80s has copied everything Vince has done. We used to have a setup in wrestling, which is bad guy's dressing room is there. Good guy's dressing room is there. They come out with no music, a towel around their neck, get their own heat, get their own crowd support getting the meat in the middle of the ring. Now Vince introduced the center ramp. So every rinky dink independent group has to come up with their own center ramp. Why? They can't do what Vince is doing better than Vince. They should have maintained the old wrestling and it would have made Vince's product look stupid, fake and phony. And they could have maintained the integrity of the business that would have still been intact today in some way. But instead, every other group had to copy everything that Vince did, and the whole business became a mockery. Because now, as the young generation comes up, they think all this tomfoolery is what wrestling was. But if Eddie Graham or Bill Watts caught any of these kids discussing what their idea of wrestling is 
and what they want to do and their vision for their character and these promoters who lack vision. Bill Watts and Eddie Graham, I couldn't imagine how they, how, how they would be looking at each other. And I will end this tirade by saying this. I saw Ricky Morton at a live event recently, and um, he said, there ain't no old way and new way. It's a right way and a wrong way. And I agree with that. You know, it's so simple, but it's the truth. Protect your gimmick. 100%. Now, what do you think the wrestling landscape is going to look like post Vince? It's an interesting time because we haven't had a time like this in the last 40 some odd years. Isn't it beautiful? Okay, I know, I know Triple H is a student, a student of the business. He idolized Ric Flair. He idolized Harley Race. I think Triple H, as a wrestling person, his heart is definitely in the right place. Now, you know, I'll tie this in. I'll tie this in. It's going somewhere, believe me. Jerry Briscoe commented on the Flair buildup and said, oh, this is the way that business should be done. This is, this is some great stuff, you know, um, building interest for the match. A lot of people could learn from this. And I wanted to respond to him and say, yeah, it would have meant something if you didn't hand Vince the keys 36 years ago and have him destroy kayfabe because now nothing means anything. So everyone talks about, oh, wrestling's gonna get good again under Triple H. But we've spent the last 36 years chipping away at wrestling's foundation. And I know Triple H appreciates wrestling's foundation, but what can you do to revive something that has been perverted into something that it never was? So my interest as a fan has completely been lost. But a lot of people are into it. And I say more power to them, I guess. Um, so you don't keep up with much current wrestling, then? I do when I have to, or if, if, if preferably there's an old guy involved, like Vince retiring and Flair coming out of retirement, whatever that was. <laughs> uh, yeah, but I don't. I, I've seen enough good wrestling by the end of the '80s to last me an entire lifetime, and it has. Because yeah. To my way of thinking, it's only gotten worse and worse as time has gone on. A lot of people's old days are my, it already sucked by then. You know, like, with all, with all due respect, by 1986, I was disgusted with what they were doing because you had Terry Funk, NWA champion, certified badass, come out there on a TNT set, Tuesday Night Titans, not TNT Impact, yeah. whatever, um, you know, their little comedy show that they did in the, in the 80s. And Terry Funk comes out there. And you're supposed to believe that it's a bar where Terry Funk knows the barmaid name and he's ordering a drink, but it's clearly on a soundstage in Stanford, Connecticut. Like what? So there's no coming back from that. You know, like within one year, Terry Funk goes from kick-ass to participating in a ridiculous skit on the Carol Burnett show. Don Morocco, one of the greatest underappreciated heels of all time. And what does everybody remember about him now? Not the great feuds with Snuka, uh, Morales, Rocky Johnson, all his Florida stuff that he did, which was amazing. And they remember Fuji Vice, the ridiculous skit that was designed to make him look like a fool. And that is, is WWF wrestling. So That's where are we going? Where, where I first going? became acquainted with him. So where are we going forward? Who knows? Because you already burned your bridge. You already burned your. You didn't keep the business alive. Hmm. If anybody else had the stewardship of professional wrestling for the last thirty-six years, let's say Crockett won the promotional war. I don't think they were the greatest businessman in the world, but I don't think they ever would have come up with. Let's ban the terms wrestling, wrestler, fans, belt. What are you kidding me? <laughs> That's why everyone hates Vince. 
because that's just anti-wrestling right there. Let's just come up with a different word for everything that was ever a part of this business. Yeah. So that that's my that's my spiel on that. No, I, it's funny. Listen, because um, you had mentioned MJF too, and I know you don't keep all the current stuff, but even before he was in AEW, I was watching him on uh, MLW one day, and they're working a program with the Von Erics, and he's just cutting them down, and you can see they're in Texas, and fans are getting legit pissed, and he's talking about, and I, it, it occurred to me. I became a fan who's just I've accepted <laughs> you know this and when I he was reminding me oh wow that's right you know right. real pissed off back in the day and when COVID happened yeah. that empty arena match that's when it really became because it wasn't an empty arena match like Terry Funk and Jerry Lawler it was like oh this is ridiculous right an empty right, right yeah you know. I heard Cornette on one of the shows recently say something to the effect of, I had to run for my life versus cowboys, Cajuns, people were literally trying to tear us apart. And for somebody like that who really lived in the business and, you know, literally put his life in danger night after night to see these people just parade around like, I was, I, I'm a peripheral character. I'm not saying that I'm in the business or ever was in the business. I was a, we had a little promotion back in the old days. I've been around for 40 years. I think that I know more about wrestling than a lot of people who are currently in it, but I still will never say that I am or was in the wrestling business. I still am a peripheral character because I will not give myself that credit compared to people who really lived it and depended on it for a living. So for these people to do what they're doing now, imagine if like you were going to be ripped to shreds by a crowd. And then 20 years later, people are just like crapping on what you were taught to um, defend with your life. Literally. Now, how did you make the jump from being just a regular fan to a fan that became, you don't want to say involved in the business, but, how did you co-mingle with the business? How did you become acquainted with it? Was it through the photography? Well, the photography was a ruse to get in because I just knew that I wanted to be a part of wrestling. And I figured the only way you can get backstage, especially as a wimpy 13-year-old kid, is you either have to be a photographer or a writer. And luckily, in wrestling, the bar was so low, I ended up in every magazine by the time I was 14 – <laughs> and it was just a matter of time before I got into better and better magazines and, and stuff like that. I mean, I always kicked myself for not going into rock and roll photography or something like that, which I could have done concurrently with wrestling if I was cooler back then or had the idea. But I don't know. I just always had this obsession. I was a self-taught photographer just because I wanted to be around the business. And it, it's like once you're taking pictures of the guys – you can give them photos of themselves and now you just met Jake the Snake and Kevin Sullivan and next week they pose for you and J.J. Dillon and whoever it was. And then they all know you, Barry Windham. That was a way to get to know all the guys. And then by the time I got to be shooting ringside, um, you know, you just become a part of the fabric. And then once you do it in one territory – you just say, oh, I shot down there. Let me shoot up here. So like when we went to uh, – Pete Letterberg and I had this fan group. We were a part of uh, – we ran the WFIA, which if you guys want to look it up on YouTube, uh, there's a thing called the WFIA Tag Team of the Year in which Tommy Rich and Eddie Gilbert turned on each other, and we, we were out there as a couple of dweebs. We gave them – the tag team of the year award, but they already hated each other. So they had this big giant brawl. I urge you all to look it up. I know you guys probably have seen it, but for the audience, uh, the WFIA tag team of the year, I'm sure anyone watching this already knows about it, but you know, the more you do, you're just in. And that's how wrestling was back then. Like, Hey, I, I did this. It, it was one small world back then. It wasn't corporate. And if you, shot for a magazine you would just tell the promoter um like when world class came down to florida i called their office i said hey i shoot for all these magazines can i just can i get a photo pass and the guy's like yeah just ask for, just ask for me when i when you get there 
I'm like, okay, who's this? He goes, Bronco Lubitsch. I'm like, oh my God, how cool. And wow. that's how it was back then. Like I, I had to deal with Duke Kiyomoka, Duke Tanaka to get my uh, press pass, if you want to call it that, it, it, to shoot in Miami. He originally didn't want to let me, and I was already in all these magazines. I was in the Norm Kaiser magazines, uh, mm -hmm. Wrestling News, uh, which pretty much was the start for every photographer. Cornette, Eddie Gilbert, uh, Paul Heyman, all started as photographers and writers like I did in the Wrestling News under George uh, – George, oh, what's his name? Apollo Norm Kaiser, Norm Kaiser, Jim Melby, and from there you go on. And my goal was to be in the After magazines. I thought that was the greatest byline that you could have. Mind you, they only paid seven dollars a photo, so it wasn't really um, it wasn't really uh, anything lucrative. But as a kid, I was obsessed with seeing my name in the After magazines. And we had a photographer in Miami, Paul Bauman. He was an older gentleman, probably the same age that I am now. Um, and I'm like, well, it's only a matter of time before he drops off and I'm going to be the new photographer in, for after in Miami. But what happened was the, the promotion died before he died. So I never got the chance and I'd left for college in 84 anyway. So I never got to do that. Um, my photos did appear in after's magazines but, you know, technically, I mean, I wasn't one of his regular guys because he had so many photographers in Florida that he didn't really need me. So that part of the dream never came true. But it all comes full circle because now I have my photos. Instead of shooting them in black and white and submitting them to the magazines, I have all my original color 8 by 10s which comes in handy for my website that's about to launch, hardwayart.com which I'm hoping to get up in time for the uh, Christmas holiday buying season for the wrestling fan in your life. And um, I urge you to, I don't mean to turn this into a plug, but while I'm on a roll, um, Hardway Art on Facebook right now, or you can friend me, Howard Baum, on Facebook to keep up with all the haps. But I didn't have to shoot in black and white. I didn't have to submit my negatives. And even shooting for Japan, which was the big money territory at the time. If you're going to be a photographer, you want to shoot for Japan. If you want to see somebody that's making money back then, or even now, those guys that are shooting for Japan, they are making money hand over fist, $350 per roll, 1982 money. And that was a, and that was not even the major Japanese magazine. That wasn't even gong. I was shooting for weekly fight. And they paid three fifty dollars per roll. And there were photographers back then that had like three cameras around their neck shooting for all the major magazines at the time. So, I mean, just showing up, that's like a $5,000 night in 1982 money. So that was, that was, that was the goal. I, they did use me, but not, again, not as a regular ongoing thing. It was just for special occasions or whatever. Um, but you know, now I have all my negatives, all my originals, and I'm turning them into artwork and I'm, I have these book projects and my prints are going to become available sometime this year, et cetera, et cetera. So that's it all amazing. works. It all works. Now, anybody that's not familiar with Hardway Art, definitely check them out. And Howard, I've looked at a lot of your pictures and what goes into getting a good shot? Like, how do you approach that? Because I'm not a photographer, and in my head, it's just random chance. You just take right. a bunch of photos. You hope you get gold. Is there any way to get the shot that you're hoping for? I and think. How do you approach it? I think that much like comedy, photography, true photography can't be taught. You have to have a feel for it. And I'm not saying I'm funny. I'm saying I'm a good photographer. And it's just because, I mean, some people, you know, it's the most frustrating thing in the world when you're someplace, especially when there's a, like, like famous wrestlers involved or something and everybody wants to get a picture. So everybody with me gets an amazing picture and I get like an upside down blurry thing with my head cut off <laughs> because the photographer never gets a good photo of himself because 
it's it mu- apparently must be some amazing talent to take pictures because to me it's always come naturally. It's just composition. My advice would be to you or anyone that's interested, pick up any wrestling magazine and look at the photos. That's it. That's how you compose a wrestling photo. Um, one of the words of advice that Paul Bauman gave me was that um, what he tries to capture a facial expression, which is fine for a rest hold or something, but that's hard to do. And I mean, if you have a fast enough camera, which today they're a dime a dozen. You, you can, it's easier to capture the action. Um, it's, it's just really all in the composition because you could tell it's like a guitar player. You could tell the player by his work. Um, I can look at wrestling photos and I know who took them. The great Theo Eret, the great Don Delion, all the guys I grew up on. Um, Raul Gomez de Molina Jr., who went on to become a TV star known as El Gordo in El Gordo and La Flaca, which is funny because he was this big, rotund photographer. He looked like Crusher Blackwell, and he was really good friends with Terry Funk back in the day. And he would go out to Terry Funk's ranch because Raul was one of these guys that was shooting for the Japanese magazines. And so years later... He used to be a paparazzi photographer and stuff too. And so I knew he knew Terry Funk. So to get in good with Terry Funk, when I first met him, I said, Hey, you remember Raul? He's like, yeah, whatever happened to him? I'm like, he's actually a TV star now on the Latin stations, El Gordo and La Flaca. He's like, El Gordo, that's hilarious. And he like, Terry Funk got a big kick out of that. And it was a good icebreaker for me and Terry Funk and all that. Um, but if I, the, my message to the kids, if you want to be a wrestling photographer, just look at any magazine and, you know, that'll give you an idea. Plus, you have to be able to um, – to to uh, there's a word for it, but I can't think of it right now. You just have to know the moves and what's coming up. Like, at what point are you going to take, you know, are you going to take the suplex before, or during, or after? That kind of thing. You have to be able to um, – Still can't think of the word. I tried for it a second time. I still <laughs> anticipate. If you watch enough wrestling, you know the layout of a wrestling exactly. match. Oh, so exactly. essentially, you know kind of around what shots you want to get. Do you want to get the lead up to the finish? Do you want to get them like making the comeback? Things like that. You can box. Like, I mean, if if it, it in the olden days, you had to rely on your flash and everything. The cameras are so good now. If I took a picture, I would have to wait 30 seconds before I would take another picture. So it's like if a guy is whipping a guy into the ropes, I'm like, do I take it when he starts to whip him in, into the ropes or do I take it when the guy comes back and he gives him a, um, a leapfrog or whatever it is? You know, you have to decide when you're going to use your one shot. This film was more expensive back then. I didn't have a fancy uh, flash pack where if my flash went off, I'd have to wait. So I had to make every shot count. So, um, I mean, now the technology is such that you can shoot and shoot. You're not spending money on film. And uh, the technology is there. The workers aren't, but the technology is. So the in- There's a lot more to shoot in ring. I mean, when I was shooting, uh, there was a lot more gravitas. Uh, you know, like I'd be shooting a Terry Funk, a Harley Race, a Dusty Rhodes, there was more gravitas to that, but there's so much more action for you to shoot now. Uh, so it's, you know, old versus new, whatever. It's all good. I don't, I don't, I don't want to sound like an old grizzled whatever, <laughs> but you can always have a modern guy on to discuss modern shit. I'm just talking about what put me on the map, you know? I'm going to turn on some mood lighting. Some oh, mood lighting man. here. And that's what interests us. Now, you've had some run-ins with some of the greats. You've talked about meeting Terry Funk. You had a great episode about when you ran into Pat Patterson not too long before he passed away. What are some of the moments in the business that you can't believe you got to experience? Oh, it's many and numerous. Am I all blown out, by the way? Because I don't have my glasses on. Did I just... um... Is You're that a, a little is that a, muffled, but that's it. Muffled audio-wise, or yes. Okay, I mean the uh, the mood lighting. I didn't realize I had an orange. Oh uh, no, the lighting looks good. 
Okay, good, good. I'll always do this. That's how I get the ladies, you know. <laughs> after a certain age, after a certain age, it's all lighting and um, well, lighting really. That's it. <laughs> Keep your lighting hair and have charisma, good lighting, right? and you'll... huh? Lighting and charisma. I guess. Keep your hair and always be in a dark room. That's my advice to the old. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm, I, I'll tell you, Terry Funk specifically, um, I started going to these things at the CAC, the Cauliflower Alley Club in, in Vegas. I, I don't remember where I first met Terry Funk, but I, I was lucky enough to meet him numerous times and his wife. And... Um, It's just the coolest thing in the world to have a conversation and talk to somebody that you grew up watching yeah. as a legend. I mean, I can't tell you a greatest Terry Funk thing. Aside from talking to him in real life, Terry Funk in particular is the coolest, the most down to earth of any of the big names. But I will tell you a fun one, which was uh, all the photographers knew and passed the word down that Terry Funk and Abdullah are the only two guys you need to be scared of. Mm. And this is, you know, before everyone, this is before everyone figured out that Terry Funk was a nice guy. Never met him before, nothing. But it was 1989, and he was working Sting for the NWA in Miami. And um, everyone said, if Terry Funk goes outside the ring, run. And what they told me my first day of being a wrestling photographer in 1982 the great Bruce Owens, timekeeper and referee, still going, as a matter of fact. And he was kind of like my mentor. He goes, if the guys come outside the ring, just lean into the lean into the ring, make yourself small, and they'll go around you. No problem. So if you watch any photographer now on any old tape, that's what they do. That you, you just lean into the ring, and they know to go around you. They're not there to beat up a photographer, except – for Terry Funk and Abdullah the Butcher, because they were unpredictable, and Abdullah would hurt you, and I never knew what Terry Funk would do because nobody ever let them him catch them. But me, I am a nut. I'd rather have a bad encounter. I'd rather have something horrible happen so I have something to talk about than just play it safe. So he, he was working Sting, and I go, you know what? I'm going to see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> I just stood there. And Terry Funk came outside the ring and throttled me. He had both hands around my neck and he was throttling me. I didn't feel a thing. He was totally working. I went down to one knee just to help him out and sell. And it was one of the greatest things that ever happened. I'm like, look at that. I let him catch me and he worked with me. He gave me a working version of beating me up. And I'm like, well, I appreciated that. But I will tell you another thing about Terry Funk. That's not to let him off the hook completely because... Terry Funk goes when he goes into character. Um, it was 1989. He was working Dusty at the PWF, their ill-fated revival of Florida wrestling, and they had a really poor house, a great card, but a poor house. 1989 at the Knight Center, and I don't know. It was just that promotion could not get a foothold, even though they had the old Florida names. So. We're all hanging out backstage. Luna, who I was good, close, personal friends with. Terry Funk. We're all shooting photos backstage. And I'm shooting photos of Luna, Terry Funk. They're all mugging it up, smiling. We're all friends. Terry Funk, a half hour later, comes out for his match. It was a bunkhouse match. So he was in his bunkhouse attire against Dusty. And um, he came out of the dressing room like a madman. And they had a big, classic, amazing match. And then he and then he went after me after the match. <laughs> he knew who I was and everything, but he came right after me. And this time, I was not willing to risk it because he looked serious. And I ran. Mm. And everyone knows that Terry Funk gets into character. He's the nicest guy. And then during the match, nothing's off limits. I still don't believe he would really hurt anybody, but just to be safe on that one night, he looked pretty scary in 89. <laughs> I, I, I don't think there's probably any stories of him doing attacking any photographer for real. I really don't because he's a nice guy. Um, but that was the reputation back then. You don't let Terry Funk catch you. And, um, and that's it for that. I mean, 
Um, as far as cool things and incidents, I mean, there's been like a million of them. Yeah, because being in the business for that long, things must just happen. And especially like you've been across the territory, so you got to see wrestling in its probably in its glory days before McMahon had finally run the territories out of the business, which is one of the greatest, I think, crimes in the history of wrestling. You don't get that variety in wrestling anymore. It's WWE and whatever version of that area of the country is putting on what they view as WWE. Yeah, because, you know, um, in the old days, one of the greatest parts of the business was the exotic wrestling, the wrestling that was not germane to your territory, which was like, you know... All, all we had in the old days was our local TV show and the magazines. And for us really, really smart fans, like I said before, before even the term smart fan was coined, was the bulletins that used to come out, ring around. Uh, I don't remember. I remember Dropkick from Jeff Singer. I don't remember a lot of the names. Um, but that's all the wrestling fan had. So uh, – Let's say that you're in Florida and Gordon Soley says, coming into the area very soon, it's going to be Mr. Wrestling 2, uh, Baron Von Raschke. And you get so excited because you never had the opportunity to see these guys before. You couldn't get on YouTube and look up The Sheik. You had to go pay for a ticket to see him or see the one promotional clip that they sent to Florida or rely on the years of magazines that featured The Sheik killing people and throwing fire and doing all these things and looking like a maniac. And it made kayfabe so much more real because I always say, you know, just going by the magazines, if, you, if that was all you had to go off of, which it was, you would think that Mil Mascaris was the most amazing. You would think that he was like Jushin Liger and he wasn't. Mil Mascaris had like three moves where he flew. And today they're not even considered flying moves. Although they were photogenic and he did cut quite a figure. I'm not taking anything away from Mill, but I'm saying by the style of work at the time, you would think that he's literally flying like a, like a cartoon person or something like he was from outer space. But then when you saw him in person, you were invariably let down because it never was as good as what the magazines led you to believe they would be. So when Baron Von Raschke came to Florida, disappointment. Here I see him in the magazines, dressed up like a Nazi, juicing people with his claw. And then he showed up and he was like, eh, not that great. Mr. Wrestling 2, worse than that. The legend, oh, with the, like the greatest good guy, Lillian Carter's favorite wrestler. He was not that great. Maybe, maybe there was a time in his career when he was, but in Florida in 1981, 82, I always looked like an old man in his underwear. And, <laughs> and you know, you weren't smartened up to the fact that in 1980, the sheet was like in his fifties and washed up and the match was going to go five minutes. You didn't know that you saw the sheik and you thought there was going to be blood and fire. You're welcome. Brian Solomon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's amazing how much even wrestling magazines have changed from the eighties to now because in the 80s, I always remember that's where you saw the blood. That's where you saw these characters, yeah. like especially us growing up in the Northeast. We were used to WWF wrestling, so vaguely cartoony. Then when TBS <laughs> came in, you're like, who the fuck are these guys? Yeah. And then you so what did you think? What did you think Nazis. when you saw the TV? What did you think when you saw the TBS? How did you uh, compare and contrast the two? I I loved TBS wrestling. It didn't matter if it was WCW Saturday night. Now that like I hear podcasts talk about it, they talk about, oh, Saturday night, how maybe it wasn't the A show. But to me, I was always like, that's my shit. That's where I found Bobby Eaton before he was even yeah. he was outside of the Midnight Express. That's when I found early Steve Austin, Ric yeah. Flair, who I hated. But at the same time, I'm like, there is something so cool about this guy. I can't put it down, but why do I hate him so much? I'll tell you what, real quick, though. Like, grew up on WWF, NWA. I saw NWA come in, 
Love that. AWA, not as much as NWA, but for a brief period, we got Mid-South Wrestling in New Jersey on some cable channel. And I was blown away at what I was seeing. All these guys that would go to WF that I already knew, because uh, they also had a thing called the Power Hour or something, where they would look back at some of the people and some of the matches from before. And Jim Ross, that's the first time I heard him. And it was just amazing. I couldn't believe what I was listening to. And that would have been around 86. We yes. got the Power Hour down here, too. They were syndicated, and that was great. Bill Watts' production was a kick-ass wrestling production because Watts learned from Eddie Graham. Eddie Graham learned from Dory Funk Sr. And what those three territories have in common, Amarillo, Florida, and UWF, were presenting wrestling as a serious sport. And that's why, you know, the old – um just going to – Bear with me here a second. They presented it like, you know, when they when they showed the old clips of Florida it, from the Fort Homer Hesterly Armory or whatever it might be, um, it was like an NFL film. It had the gravitas of of like an NFL Vince Lombardi film or something, or like Dusty at the at the Fort Hesterly versus Harley Race or whatever. Um, and so all of those territories, the Bill Watts, the Eddie Graham, they presented it as a serious sport, which is the antithesis of Vince, as we know. So I think intrinsically, you were looking for a grittier, more realistic, hard-hitting product. And if you think WCW Saturday Night was something or, or Watts, which nothing to take away from that, you should have seen Florida in the 70s, which I think... Uh, my two favorite territories ever and the periods therein would be Florida 70s, which I say from about 75 to 80 and Memphis, like 82 through 85. Those are my two favorite territories for excitement, action. And I, I'm not going to say that Memphis presented things in a realistic fashion, but my trips to Memphis, which I took in 83, 84 and 85 were the most fun, exciting trips. I had more fun in Memphis for a total of eight or 12 weeks, however long I was ever there, than I did with years of Florida. Because it, Jerry the King Lawler would pal around with you and just be down to earth backstage. And we were hanging out with Eddie Gilbert, Lance Russell, Jimmy Hart, just like normal people, but they were their characters. So it wasn't normal people. <laughs> when you're seeing those guys, that's them. And Florida was not like that. Dusty would come in the dressing room and say, you guys got to get out of here. Mm. And Dusty would like, so I mean, Florida was not a fun backstage environment. I mean, as far as I was concerned, I mean, I was just, every time I was backstage, I thought, Every time I walked to the ring or went backstage for anything, I said, this could be the last time I ever do this because I was just always ready to get fired. I was just always ready to get like told you're done. And so I minded my P's and Q's. I just like every minute I was there backstage doing something or whatever, I was like, you better take it in because the day is going to come when they tell you you're gone because it was so precarious. I wasn't there under any official circumstances. I wasn't working for a magazine. I was just a kid. And, um, you know, I, uh, Kevin Sullivan was one of the guys. A lot of the guys were very friendly and everything, but the higher-ups were not. Like, um, you know, Dusty. Uh, everyone else was cool. I mean, Dusty was part of the promotion, but when I was a kid, I used to hang around in the back with, Kevin Sullivan, whoever, but everybody was really cool. Scott McGee, Barry Windham, like I said. I don't know how I got onto this, but <laughs> yes, gritty wrestling. Gritty wrestling is where it was at. And and just I was raised on that. So anything lesser than that is 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 a preposterous embarrassment to me. Now, speaking of an embarrassment and things going downhill. Let's finish up by talking about Ric Flair's last match. It occurred last weekend 
it was the talk of the wrestling, I'd say, world. And I <clears throat> love the rest of the card. I thought the thing was put together well. I don't know what I expected out of Ric Flair's last match, but what I got wasn't it. And I almost felt sad for participating in a way, like being there. Yeah. And it was tough because he was one of the best. I'm right. all for somebody going out on their own notes, having wanting to do it under Crockett Promotions, who he never got to go out well with. But I don't know what he expected in the ring. But what we got was, I'd say, kind of jarring to like an actual fan. Um, now that I've had a couple of days to digest it, the night that I saw it, a, a part of me literally died. Um, and I said, well, this is just, um, I felt sad, complicit, not that I paid for it. I just watched like a free recap on YouTube or something, but here's the deal leading into it. I said, there's no upside. Mm. What can be gained? And they gave this man the greatest send-off, not in wrestling, but in sports history. Mm. It was a week-long celebration of everything Flair. As a human being, at that point, if he was a normal human being, he should have been so happy that he accomplished something. Now he's in his 50s. He can just coast. That's what Buddy Rogers did. All Buddy Rogers had to do the rest of his life was show up, look cool, and you're the man for life. As Flair said, it's called over for life. But Ric Flair never knew himself as a person. And he derives his worth only from being Ric Flair the wrestler. So he is forced to keep himself preserved in amber as the 1985 Ric Flair. Which, you know, I've accomplished nothing in my life compared to Ric Flair. And I'm ready to rest on my laurels. I don't know why that man would have such a problem resting on his laurels. If I had that many reams of videotape, photos, magazine covers, most decorated, coolest wrestler of all time. Now you fast forward to 2022. And, you know, I, as far as a match, I said, there's nothing to be gained. Why do it? And then he hoodwinked me. Because they showed him doing his quarter rep squats, mm -hmm. 500 at a time, which I'm sure the camera just like they turned it on at 490 or something. <laughs> but but I thought, now we saw we we saw Luthez as an old man and he sucked. We saw Dory Funk Jr. as an old man and he sucked. And everyone's like, oh, but it's Ric Flair. Now, my big question, and this is the time to pay attention, folks, because I know I've been rambling about this, but this is the main point I want to make about the Ric Flair thing, is this, okay? At what point did Flair or his handlers realize that he was in no condition to go? And by go, I mean not be amazing in the ring. Nobody's expecting Tiger Mask versus Dynamite Kid. <laughs> but I mean, he looked bad from the second he came out, and it only went worse from there. By the time he got to the ring, he was disheveled. Couldn't even keep his robe on. Couldn't even get into the ring. By the time they had to hand him the brass knucks, he was so out of it that he looked like the dad in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre when they were trying to give him the hammer to hold, huh. to hit the girl over the head with. And so the question is this. I don't begrudge Ric Flair. I don't think it was wise. I don't know if it's if it's his fault. I don't know if it, how much – who is really in control here? I'm not here to crap on Conrad, his family, his handlers, his enablers. I don't know what combination of alcoholism, mental deficiencies on Flair's behalf, esteem problems. I don't know what combination, but I would really like to know. A lot of people say it's a cash grab and I'm like, no, I think it's more important for Flair to just feel like Ric Flair to be in the news, 
to be training, to have the eyes on him, and to be known as a wrestler, not as a pitch man for wings, boner pills, the car thing he's doing, anything that would come along, put Ric Flair in some cheap looking <laughs> Halloween robe of a Ric Flair outfit and parade him out there. Ric Flair drip, like so many things where he doesn't belong. But fine. That's what he should be doing at this age. But his ego would not have that. I would like to know if on the day of the show, was he drunk? Is it because he hurt his foot? Could he not go this entire time? And he knew it and they know it. And they just pretended he could go. Because he didn't even come out there and woo or strut. That's all the people would have needed or wanted. Just a woo and a strut with some energy behind it. But he could not even do that. And if that's the case, I do feel like it's a cash grab. Because if he or everyone else knew that he couldn't go to the extent that he couldn't even come out there and, and exert himself saying a woo and doing a convincing strut, that's bad. That's just bad and sad. And uh, that's really all I have to say. It's a tragedy that that took place. You want to go out on your own terms? He did. Why ruin it? Yeah. It, he doesn't know when to say quit. And I think that was the saddest part of this. Like, I saw Ric Flair's last match, and I'm like, is it? And after this one, if there's another one, there's no money to be made there. I can't see any wrestling fan hearing that again and saying like, that's worth checking out. It might be aside from the rest of the card, that match was one of the sadder things I've ever seen. <laughs> well, let me tell you something. Huh. Uh, that was the saddest, most soul crushing. Just, I mean, in real life, there's a lot of Ric Flair's and asshole stories going around. I don't have any of my own. But there's enough stories where he's not great to deal with financially, whatever. But can we at least, can some of us keep a piece of our childhood? I, like believe in something? Does everything have to be desecrated? There was no upside to him doing that. Unless it was, unless he was going to be the greatest old man match ever. And I held out a little hope for that. He's Ric Flair, and he, 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 he showed everyone what great shape he was in on those little videos. Yeah. So, I mean, even I bought into it, like, I never thought of it from a business or financial or a cash grab standpoint. I always saw it for what I think drives Flair, which is psychologically, he has to be Ric Flair, the wrestler, to have any self-worth whatsoever. That's where he derives all of his ego fulfillment from and which is sad because if anyone deserves to coast on their name, it's Ric Flair. Now he took that away from us and he really did. One and, and, and I mean, if you look even at the comments on Ric Flair's own page, it's divided into two camps, which is, Oh, so glad for you champ. You did it. Blah, blah, blah. Because I think they were just happy to see him survive. <laughs> and then everyone else is like, man, you never should have done that. And in his bubble, I believe in his bubble, which is buoyed by ego and alcohol, uh, I bet he thinks he did great. And more power to him. He's Ric Flair. And he was one of my boyhood idols. And this thing was so pointless. Um, I, if anybody could tell me an upside to it, I, I'd be more than happy because I didn't expect a great match, but this was so much worse than I would have bargained for. And I've never felt like a weird combination of like sick, like really sick in a way and guilty for like viewing it. Like it was, um, uh, it was it was like elder exploitation combined with a freak show. It was just sad. And then for anyone to put it over is just insane. Definitely. Now, 
Thank you for coming on. We have kept you long enough. Before we let you go, I want to give you a chance to promote what you'd like to promote. But is there any chance we could get you to promote in the Don Morocco voice? <laughs> uh, uh, well, that's a let me. Tell, it's a, it's a behind the curtain industry secret. Don Morocco imitation requires a lot of weed and Jack and Coke. So I can't say that I am prepared at this point in time. <laughs> now I wouldn't be I wouldn't be doing it a service if I, I I every time I try to do it on the fly it's not as good so I don't want to diminish the character of the magnificent one. No problem. So, I had uh, to ask, but promote what you'd like to promote, and where can people find you? Um. Okay. Um. Just for right now, we're planning on launching the Hard Way Art dot com site in time for all your Christmas shopping for right now. In the meantime, I beseech you people either look me up on Facebook. I think my name is right beneath me right now yes. or hard, hard way art, H A R D W A Y A R T also on Facebook. I have a ton of my artwork photos, a little uh, sample of what you can expect in the future. And that's about it. That's really all I can promote right now. So mahalo and go <laughs> fuck yourself. <laughs> Howard, thank you for the laughs. Thank you for what you do. And we are sure that our fans will check out Hardway Art in time for Christmas. Have a good night. So long.